Hi, and welcome to today's podcast. We're talking with Dr. Avon McMaster, who studied classics and is now a teacher at a local university. Another interesting tidbit about Dr. McMaster, she has a podcast with her husband called The Endless Knot. As you saw, her subject is Greek and Roman sexuality. And due to using some of the appropriate terms that we would have to use in order to talk about the subject, I've marked this podcast explicit in case there are little ears running around and listening during some of these podcasts. But as usual, there's no swearing, anything like that. So it's up to you to decide. In this podcast, we talk to academics, enthusiasts, students, scholars, and so many more. As you notice, not all the topics here are Canadian, but I am. I'm Rosie, and I'm a Francophone from Canada. This is my podcast. Time to delve into some ancient history, hey? So today we're talking with Avon McMaster, and I'll let her introduce her topic, which you probably saw in the podcast title, <laughs> but it's still fun if you can introduce it. Sure, thanks. I'm happy to be here, and I'm going to talk today about some of the history of sexuality in the Greek and Roman worlds. So it's a big topic. I could talk about it for a long time, but we'll kind of do the basics of what sexuality was and how it worked and how it was thought of. Starting basically for somebody who knows nothing. Yeah. Up to so when I say Greek and Roman world, I'm thinking our source material kind of covers from Homer. So that's like 8th century BC through to, let's say, 3rd century AD. Whenever I have to do those yeah. uh, <laughs> those things that in my head, so I'm thinking, now someone's going to argue with each one of those dates. <laughs> Something about that. And in particular, I'll talk a little bit about Homer, but mostly about Athens. When I talk about Greek I mainly, like most scholars, mean Athens because that's where most of our material comes from. And then I'll talk about Roman, meaning Rome and the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do we know anything about sexuality in that time? You said a little bit about writings, but what types of writings are we mentioning here? So we can talk about, there's a little bit of actual prescriptive sort of writing about what people should and shouldn't do that's mostly medical. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of actually addressing the topic. But for the most part, what we're doing when we talk about sexuality is we're reading work that is on some other topic or about something else and looking for clues. If we look at Epic by Homer, which is one of the big poems, the Iliad or the Odyssey, we can look at the relationships that people have within that and the words they use. One of the things you can often use is the insults. When people insult other people, that gives you a lot of information about expectations and societal norms. So we can look at that. We can look at, um, there's a lot of love poetry from the archaic Greek period and then onward. So we can look at love poetry and, you know, basics like who is writing love poetry to whom? What do they want to do? Love poetry also encompasses sort of hate poetry. (laughs) So again, you can see by the insults or by the kind of stuff that people say they don't want to do or whatever that you can get a lot of information. Another really good place to look is law cases. So the law courts, people are, uh, in both Greek and Roman law, a big part of the evidence is actually character evidence most of which would be thrown out of courtroom today. But it's, you know, is this person the sort of person to do that is not only a legitimate argument, but sort of the main argument. So a lot of argumentation in our law cases is about what kind of a person the defendant is or the prosecutor. And therefore, you know, again, we can look for character assassination and also for, oh, he was a great man. He treated his wife well or whatever, right? So we can get a sense of those things. Plus, we actually have a couple of prosecution cases of people who are accused of being prostitutes or, you know, things like that, which help us out. And then everything else is just gleaning it from, you know, the letters of Cicero or from, it's always from bits and pieces. The other kind of main evidence we have is visual evidence. And in particular in the Greek world, but also the Roman world, there's a lot of art that shows what we would consider erotic or sexual themes. And so by looking at that, we can get some sort of sense of... (sighs) It's a bit tricky. We can't necessarily get a sense of what people actually were doing. It might be like an artistic license. It could be artistic license or, you know, um, in the same way that if you look at a bunch of movies now, that doesn't give you a perfect example of what everyone's doing in the bedroom Uh, for a lot of different reasons. It might be more chaste or it might be more 
crazy <laughs> than people actually, you know, have time for mm-hmm. in their day to day life. So, but it still gives us, a, you know, an idea of the realm of possibility and mm-hmm. the range of, um, you know, what people thought of as normal or not. So when we look at all of these sources, mm-hmm. if we want to call them primary sources, yeah. I guess. In ancient studies, uh, I was just teaching a class on this. We use primary sources to mean anything beyond which we can't go. And often, so often a primary source might be a few hundred years later than the thing we want to know about, but we still call it a primary source. It's as close yeah. as we can get. We're not yeah. going to get earlier than than that. So yeah, these are primary sources. Yeah. Okay. So using the primary sources of these typical things mm-hmm. that you've mentioned, then we can now extrapolate all the information, kind of piece it together yeah. to have a good picture of what the society would have. Yeah. And I mean, of time. course, like with any subject, mm-hmm. there's lots of argument about mm-hmm. it. And in particular study of sexuality in the ancient world as a real field is relatively new. Um, Classics ancient studies as a field is very old, so things move kind of slowly. So when I say relatively new, I mean maybe 30 years old. You know, there was sort of a view, and then there was sort of the first scholars came up with like, no, it's different, it's this. And then that's been being refined and argued against. And so what I'm going to say today is sort of the consensus view, but bear in mind that a lot of the points I'm making, there's somebody out there who disagrees with it. But I'll give you kind of what the general consensus is. Um, on and as, as I mentioned at the intro of the podcast, mm-hmm. I mean, you do teach classes and mm-hmm. this being actually one of your classes. Yeah, I teach a class called Sex and the Body in the Ancient World. Mm-hmm. Um, sexuality and sex isn't the only part of it. We do talk a lot about some other stuff too, but yeah, so I'm, I'm well versed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm up on the sort of current debates. Um, again, when things are at edge cases, I kind of leave that until it's a little more resolved, but Mm -hmm. I'll I'll flag a couple of things as we go through. So what was the typical sexual identity in the ancient world? Okay, so we will start by deconstructing a question. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to sort of frame this in terms of differences and similarities to now. Mm -hmm. One of the key differences is in the ancient world, much like until the modern period, I would say, there wasn't so much a, a sexual identity for someone. So people didn't think about or at least we don't have evidence for people thinking about sexuality as sort of an intrinsic part of who they were. So today someone might say, I am heterosexual, or I am homosexual, or I am bi, or, you know, various things, right? It's an identity, and very much an identity today. For an ancient Greek or Roman, it would be much more to say, what do I do? What are the activities I engage in? And what is the status of the person with whom I engage in it? And those things might change. Some people might act one way with one group of people at one age, and then at a different age do something different, and then at a different age do something different. Do I'll come, an example? Yeah, okay. I'll come back to sort of the specifics in a moment. Yeah. But over time, those activities might change, or you might engage in various different kinds of activities that we now would categorize as being separate identities. Mm-hmm. So usually the scholarly, again, this is one of the things people argue about, but usually the scholarly practice has been not to use terms like heterosexual or mm-hmm. homosexual to refer to the ancient world because those refer to identity as opposed to act. So one might talk about a homosexual act, sex between two people of the same sex, but not necessarily homosexuality. So what was the sort of standard? I'll start with Greece. For an upper class Greek man, which is the group about whom we have the most information, and we always start to lose our information very quickly as soon as any of those bits change. Um, But for an upper class Greek man in the classical period, It would be standard as a young boy, as a young man between the ages of, let's say, 12 to 18, somewhere around there, to be what was called an aramanos, which is the passive of the verb to love, so a beloved one, somebody who is loved, of an older man, the erastes, the lover, who would probably be somewhere between 18 and 25 or 30, 30 being on the high end there, definitely with an age separation. And to be the recipient of homosexual attention. And that would be the way it was thought of, without that term homosexual, but a recipient of sexual attention from an older man. That would be very standard and was considered in Greek aristocrat or Athenian aristocratic circles to be, you know, like the way you should do it, the best high class relationships. It would also be not, as far as we can tell, not unusual for boys that age to also have relationships between one another, like amongst so young themselves, boys young boys together. But that relationship, which is usually called pederasty, which obviously is sort of to distinguish it from pedophilia, which is now yeah. like considered a, a pathological. At the time, it was an acceptable, uh, and we could discuss or not, as you wish, to what degree we think it was acceptable, but it was considered at the time normal. And there was sort of an idealized element to it where it was educational, and the older man was the mentor for the younger man, and the relationship would be started and carried out at the gymnasium, which is where they would exercise in the nude and athletic contests. 
but also learn music and other sort of manly, aristocratic skills. He would be involved and responsible to some extent for the education of the young man. And also he would be, you know, introducing him around and giving him the connections he needs. And, but there would also be sex. We have lots of visual representations of courting or of a suitor, which involved the two nude men, one with a beard, one without, to show the age difference. Mm -hmm. And the man with a beard is one hand under the chin of the young man and one hand on the genitals. And that's a standard sort of like courting the young man. Um, there's others where they they give gifts, so you're supposed to give gifts to your beloved, to the younger man. And then reciprocate with sex, either fastidious terminology is intercrural, mm. or the other, this is not very fastidious, or anal penetration. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the sort of decorous one was face-to-face -face between the thighs, and, but that it was very common and normal to have anal sex. And that relationship would then pass. So this is what I mean by like its stages of life. As you grew up, you would then take on the role of the older and the younger in the standard ideal setting. It's not a long-term relationship. And then you take on the next role. You become the older man to a new younger man. And then around age 25 or 30, you get married. And so when you marry, in the sort of standard normative way, you would kind of stop having these relationships. It wasn't completely unheard of to be married and also having one of these relationships because Greek men were not required to be monogamous mm -hmm. or faithful. Uh, Greek women were, but Greek men weren't. But you would have get married and you would be expected to father children. So, you know, this is what I mean by no identity. It's, no, it's mm -hmm. not that you were gay and now you're not gay or mm -hmm. that you're bi because that suggests that some people are that and some people aren't. This is just... A what everyone does. Norm, it's a societal norm. Mm -hmm. Class-wise, it's not clear if the lower class is either engaged in or approved of such things. Mostly not clear. We have a few indications that they don't always, but we have so little understanding of what lower classes thought because they didn't do the writing. Mm -hmm. So we just don't know. But yes, this was the standard. So this pederastic relationship was considered mm -hmm. normal and not just normal, but good. So that's sort of the Greek. Once you were married, you would have your wife, with whom you would have sex, in order to procreate. And it would also be very common for you to go, or very normal, for you to go to prostitutes. Mainly female, but also boys. So it's this sort of high-class relationship with another high-class citizen boy. But then there's also prostitutes, who are mostly slaves, who could be male or female, um, with which you could have just sex. There's no like educational relationship, there's no ideal. Yeah. And they have no status, they have no standing. They have no rights to anything, yeah. yeah. Not even their own body, right? You can mm -hmm. you can choose what you do to them. Um, so that would also be, it would be considered quite normal for a married man to be going to the brothel sometimes. It also would be normal for his wife to disapprove of that, you know, like, but it wouldn't be seen as, it was, it was certainly not illegal and it was not even really frowned upon. Whereas if a woman were to, so a girl is supposed to have no sexual relations or contact with any man whatsoever until she is married, and she would traditionally marry sometime soon after first menarch, so sometimes between 13 and 18, um, and marry an older man, right, who's 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. Though those ages seem to have been fairly fluid, you know, we kind of have we have to guess at some of that. So it may, they may have been closer in age sometimes, and probably in the lower class they probably were closer in age. There's just different things that they're required or not required to be doing and different practices of you know, different life expectations. And, you know, you start working much younger yeah. when you're lower class rather than spending longer on education, things like that. So as a woman, you'd go straight from girl to wife and be expected to be a mother very soon after that. And you would be expected to not engage in any extramarital sex or anything that would even allow anyone to accuse you of it. Uh, in Athens, at least, women were quite, not completely restricted to the home or anything, but they were fairly tightly guarded in various ways so as to make sure to keep the appearance of chastity, not just actual chastity. Unless, of course, you were an enslaved person, in which case the only person who gets to restrict what happens to your body is your master. You don't have to go down to a brothel if you've got slaves in the house, for instance. But again, totally double standard. A woman caught having sex with a male slave would certainly be divorced. Worse might happen. So, so that's there was sort of, clear punishment for women. Yes, it would be writings. adultery. Yeah. yeah, Any sex outside of marriage is considered adultery on the part of the woman, and unless she can prove that it was rape, and even if it was rape, she may well be divorced anyway, um, but certainly she's in deep trouble. And what did the divorce mean at that time? In Athens, uh, it was not impossible to remarry after that, but basically you went back to your father's house they give you dowry back, but that's it. You don't keep the kids. The kids are always the husbands. So it was possible to remarry, but if you'd been divorced for cause, that'd be very difficult. If it was for political reasons, which did sometimes happen, 
then it might not be such a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if everyone knew why, then, you know, if it was either infertility or adultery, which would be the two sort of shameful reasons. And so now we looked at the Greeks, mm -hmm. and the Romans had a different way or a similar Yeah, so there's way? an overlap. The sort of normative Roman sexuality is a little more what we would call heterosexual, but from fairly early on, they seem to have also had... Um, the only reason I hesitate is that they tended to consider it Greek to have that pederasty or what we would call homosexuality mm -hmm. was sort of more Greek and had been imported to Rome. Mm -hmm. But they say that about a lot of stuff and it's not always true. So like they think of it or those who are being grumpy about it consider it Greek, but there's not really a lot of evidence to say it wasn't around. It may have just changed. In Athens, you have these citizen boys, right, who go through a period of time. And we'll come back to sort of the bad stuff, like what you weren't supposed to do and what's sure. wrong. But mm -hmm. so it's normal to be the recipient when you're young and then the instigator of sex. And I will put that clearly because as a boy, to be, I have to use fairly explicit That's terminology, okay. to be, for a boy to be anally penetrated is mm -hmm. acceptable for a citizen boy in Greece. Once he gets to a sort of adulthood, it is no longer acceptable, and he must be the one penetrating. He must be the one who's the initiator so and the, the active. Have to flip. The roles have to flip mm -hmm. to be sort of normative. And then, of course, when he's interacting with a woman, they will naturally mm -hmm. go that direction as well. In Rome, that idea that a citizen boy could at, has a sort of youthful period where him being the recipient is okay does not apply. So that's a fairly major distinction. Mm -hmm. But Rome... At no point should a citizen boy, especially an upper class one, be the recipient of penetrative sex, period. If he is ever, under the sort of normative ideals, he's lost his manliness forever. That's it. He's done. He has submitted. He has been womanly. He has been effeminate. Now, I can come back to some like mm -hmm. real world examples of how this is a bit muddier in the real world. But that's sort of the ideological position. And so that's very different. So while there is lots of what you might call pederasty in the sense of adult Roman men who liked having sex with younger men and boys. It's all a little problematic, very problematic anyway. But when I say boys, I do want us to think that they're sort of 14, 15, 16. You know, people were getting married at 15. That doesn't necessarily make it right. I'm not trying to say what's right or wrong. But when we say boys, I think there is sometimes a tendency to be like eight-year-olds or something. It's not yeah. quite that drastic. It really, I should also not rule out that mm -hmm. people were having, you know, sex with people who were considered even in their own society to be children. But the sort of more standard is sort of we're talking 12, yeah. 13 as your lower limit for regular activities. So in Rome, those activities are very common still and not considered problematic for the man to engage in. But the recipient can't, like, it will ruin their reputation. So the people you're going to have sex with are going to be slaves, slaves and foreigners. Um, and that is fine from the adult, no mark on his manliness, perfectly manly to have sex with a slave boy. But if you, so this is why I say, like, you get it from um, invective a lot. You know, if you're going to accuse your opponent in court or in politics of having been debauched, <laughs> that's the term that's almost used in these translations, debauched by a man when he was in his youth, that's like a stain on his character that proves that he's not manly enough to really be consul or whatever. So there isn't that stage. But those same men who are having sex with slave boys are also marrying women, having children, and also having sex with female prostitutes. Um, so our love poetry, we have lots of love poetry from poets who write some love poems to women and some love poems to boys. Right? They're not considered exclusive. It's not mm -hmm. that now there are people definitely who have preferences and there's discussion of preferences and there's even there's a whole genre of it's written in Greek mainly of, of poetry from the Hellenistic period. So that's like between 300 and BC to zero to 30 BC, sort of that sort of period. Mm -hmm. um, and then some from later, a whole bunch of stuff where it's people like arguing the merits of women versus boys. And they're very explicit. How smooth do you like them? And what do you like this and that? And and then there's ones about like, oh, boys always want gifts and women don't or vice versa. women always. And so, you know, it's clear from that that there were people who had preferences and that it was quite normal. Call somebody a boy lover, for instance, was not a very nasty thing to say particularly. It was just to sort of designate them. So that, you know, creeps towards identity there. Um, and we can maybe come back to that because there's some evidence that maybe there is some, there are some people who are sort of forming identity around their sexual preferences Smaller groups of people but but in a in a non-mainstream way you know a way that might be considered maybe queer now in the sense that it's outside of mm -hmm. the sort of normative approaches and it's very normal then for you to want and again same double standard women are not supposed to have sex with anyone at all 
but divorce is much more common in Rome, upper class Rome, and has less of a stigma and is common for lots of political reasons and women remarrying is very normal. So, and there seems to have been much more liberty among the upper class women that they did in fact have affairs fairly regularly, you know, like Mm -hmm. think sort of 19th century England where everybody's over every ever so proper, but everyone's having affairs all the time. So some of these proper women are definitely having sex. So, and they're not getting called out so much as the Greek. It seems. Yeah. There's fewer restrictions on them, but certainly nonetheless, if you do actually accuse a Roman woman of having an affair, it's a big deal. I mean, Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, ends up having to exile first his daughter and then his granddaughter to islands because they are so flagrantly adulterous. The exile is not necessarily the way it always worked either, but the prominent women, there were various um, punishments. legal punishments yeah. for being found in adultery. But with his daughter and his granddaughter, it was, it was not just that they committed adultery, it's that they did it really, really a lot <laughs> and really publicly, and he ended up having to get rid of them. So... It was, you know, it was still a shame to be called an adulteress or something like that. It was not good, depending on what your husband felt about it and whether mm-hmm. it was a big deal to him or not. And what was important also was that there was no doubt about the paternity of your children. You know, that's one of the main reasons adultery is such a big deal. Julia famously, the first Julia, his daughter, said, oh, no, I'm very careful. I never have an affair unless I have, she used a different idiom, but a bun in the oven. I never take on passengers unless I already have one, is what she said. So she would only ever have an affair when she was already pregnant, so she could promise her husband that all the children were his. So Trying yeah. to get a, around the laws. and Well, and, not and around, but like she was flagrantly <laughs> just ignoring the laws, but she was sort of saying, no, like I'm, you know, I know what's important is that my children are their father's children. So how do I, you know, in a world without good birth control, how do I make sure of that? I just make sure I'm already pregnant. Terrible. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, something sort of admirable about it too, but anyway. <laughs> the societies were very patriarchal. Oh, extremely. And extremely. even on that side, they were very patriarchal. Oh, yeah, no, the Roman society is still extremely patriarchal, and there's lots and lots of rules about women's behavior in, in many ways. Mm-hmm. So that's your sort of basic. So you can see why it's hard to say, like, well, we tend not to use the terms homosexual or yeah. homosexuality um, or heterosexual. In you know, People often say, oh, the Romans and Greeks were bi. And I mean, yes, but only if that means like everybody is. So it's not really about sexual preference. It's about expected sexual activity. And, you know, they liked young boys. They didn't like them once they started to have the signs of puberty. So again and again and again, we're told that boys stop being attractive when they get uh, facial hair or pubic hair, when they get start to get hair in general, or their voice breaks. Those are the signs of now he's not attractive anymore. Not just that he's too old for this position, but also he's not interesting. So I'm not saying that they wanted their boys to look like women, but there were things that they liked about both boys and women. Soft skin, smooth skin, white skin, because they hadn't been outside very much yet, so light-colored skin, um, you know, softness of thighs. Women, we don't hear about breasts as being particularly erogenous much of the time, like sometimes, but mostly it's about thighs and bums. Very into thighs and bums. (laughs) Really into them. (laughs) So, you know, and you can see how those are kind of interchangeable, boys and and women, in a sense. That's not to deny that there's a difference (laughs) between them. You know, I'm not trying to, like, flatten it or say, oh, they weren't really attracted to men, because they were. But it's not quite the same as um, saying, like, there's a complete attraction to the male body Mm -hmm. only, or the women female body only. They kind of lump them together a little bit. Yeah, there's sort of, there's women and boys Mm -hmm. as one category, and then adult men as the other category. And that's what's important in terms of sexual categories. So when they're defining it, that's kind of what you see over and over. Yeah. Yeah. And the the Greeks and the Romans seem to have a very similar outlook for these things. Yes, though, as I said, the real mm-hmm. uh, an important key there is what they think how permissible it is to be the male recipient mm-hmm. of male attention um, at different stages in life. So the societal norms, mm-hmm. as you've kind of pointed out, I'm guessing there were some that were different. Yeah, that were so not as accepted. As I said, a lot of what we know about the norms comes from sort of people accusing others of breaking them. Right. Mm-hmm. So I've talked about ideal behavior. Ideal behavior is never what everybody does. In fact, most ideals are intentionally sort of unattainable, and then it's just about how close you can come. So we know, for instance, that, first of all, lots of women had interest affairs. Mm -hmm. We know that there were men who uh, continued to play the passive role into adulthood, 
or at least we know that that's a common accusation of men is that they continue to enjoy the passive role and uh, to enjoy it beyond once mm. they sort of left teenagehood and you know went into their 20s if they still enjoyed it that was unmanly um, in the Greeks also. in the Greeks as well mm-hmm. yeah Greeks and Romans both and that was considered a problem and you know made you unfit for public service it made you unfit for government it made you a bad soldier unless it didn't because we have a lot, of, like, everybody's accused of it. So if everybody's accused of it, even if most of them aren't doing it, it does seem like it's presented as if it's an absolute mark of shame that nobody could possibly be a participant. You know, if we could prove that this had it's happened, so you could do it. It's so terrible, nobody can be doing yeah. this. But at the same time, A, probably people are, and B, people are throwing this accusation around so much that one kind of wonders how much it really meant. It was just sort of a standard tick, 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 I'm going to accuse him of all of these things. And that way he can't be part of it. He can't be part of it, except people seem to have ignored it. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people are accused of it who go on to be prominent politicians. I mean, mostly we only know people are accused of such things because they're prominent politicians. (laughs) So how much of a bar to their being politicians can it be, right? So, you know, it kind of... It's sort of a standard accusation. Yeah, which doesn't necessarily mean it actually... Either that it actually happened or that people actually thought it was that big a deal Mm -hmm. in practice. It's a stick you can use to beat people with, but whether in practice people, just like adultery in the Roman world or whatever, definitely a bad thing, very wrong, and yet, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not all the women were jailed or whatnot. Exactly. And also, then we also have some evidence for men who continued in those relationships past puberty and or may, had relationships with people more their own age as adults that don't seem to have been massively stigmatized. So there's a famous example in Plato's Symposium that of a couple who are you know lovers and acknowledged lovers, even though they're both adults. And there are some others that sort of are together till they die. And, you know, so there seem to be were some... Were they still married to a woman? Um, I, to be honest, I can't remember okay. those, but they might have been. They like, I don't been, think yeah. that would have been considered in any way relevant, if you see what I mean. So they still had like, children with somebody, yeah, but they kept but their they relationships. Kept the relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, there may have been some who didn't. I, we're now a stepping a little, a little outside fuzzy. of what I, mm-hmm. what I remember clearly. So, you know, we do seem to have some evidence for what we might then think of as more akin to a modern homosexual relationship, long-term relationship, where people are in love with one another rather than sexual partners only. Uh, and who continue to have that relationship in a long-term way. Some of it's love poetry, more of it's in Plato, actually, but um, and some other places that we have mention here and there. I can't think of any love poetry of that. The love poetry tends to be much more, but when we say love poetry in the ancient world, we mean sex. We mean sex poetry. Yeah. It's not really erotic about love. love. Yeah, poetry. it's erotic. It's poetry about sexual relationships, mm-hmm. um, which are expressed in these terms of great passion, et cetera, et cetera, but they're like transient, basically. So it seems like there were certainly some people who were outside of these this sort of standard progression that you make and then hung on to one position or another for longer or just were more interested in one. So there we can see maybe a sexual preference. And similarly, and, and we have more evidence for Rome, there seems to be a class of people or a group of people or a... It's fuzzy because this is where we don't have great evidence. We're really having to pick out of the corners of bare mentions and stuff. But there do seem to be a group of men. So one of the terms that of abuse that is used to refer to a man who enjoys being a passive recipient. Mm-hmm. Not a young boy. Mm-hmm. Well, and in Rome, even if it's a young boy, like, you know, the idea that if you're upper class and you enjoy it, then it's bad because sure. it's a standard character. One of the standard terms is kinidus, C-I-N-A-E-D-U-S. So the kinidi. This term sort of means effeminate, enjoys passive homosexuality, not really male, okay? Not really manly. Male in their physical characteristics, but not manly in their, not a man in their gender presentation and uh, activities. And this term is thrown around as a term of abuse for a canidus, you know, like calling somebody words I don't want to repeat in English. Um, I'm happy to use slurs in Latin (laughs) because no one knows them, but but not in English. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, sort of thrown around to various people. It's a very negative term. It's a negative term. However, there seem to have been a, a number of people who are referred to by various, in various contexts and various authors as being like openly and clearly sort of flaunting that persona, you know, dressing in a way that is seen as clearly effeminate acting in a way that is seen as clearly effeminate, even though they are not Greek and not slaves, like they're adult citizen men. And normally most of our sources, they condemn them. But it's not like those men don't know that they're doing it. You know, like they know they're dressing in these ways and acting in these ways and people are acting like this. So it suggests the possibility of, and really here I have to be very 
careful, like this is supposition, but it suggests the possibility of, and there's various people who have argued, I'm using other people's work here for sure, argued that there may have been kind of a subculture of people who were openly effeminate. I know I keep using that term and it's not a great term in the modern world, but it's just, it's, they yeah. mean a man who acts like a woman, a womanly man who act that way and advertise themselves for as enjoying, you know, sex in a way that men aren't supposed to. And if they think it's shameful, they would hide it, right? These are hideable mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> activities. Yeah. These are not, um, maybe the activity itself might be, you know, rumored or whatever, but like, you don't need to dress like, like, so they seem to be sort of advertising it. And when things here of queer coded, you know, clothing choices or jewelry choices or acting choices or accents or, you know, all of these things that have been a feature, even when the activities themselves were illegal or frowned mm-hmm. upon, like there's, you know, you have these subcultures And here at Rome, they're not even that illegal. They're just frowned upon. And so it seems like there may have been people, men we're talking about here mainly. There may have been women too, but finding those is... Impossible. Even more. Like, we can imagine there would have been because people are people, but beyond that, we don't really have evidence Mm -hmm. for it. But for men, we have some tantalizing pieces of evidence that suggest, you know, there were sort of subcultures who were quite happy to code themselves as, let's at least say, non-mainstream, right? As Mm -hmm. not quite the manly men that Roman expectations were, that they would be. And yet, still, some of them, anyway, participated to some extent in public life. Um, They weren't shunned. They were at dinner parties. They were, you know, we know they were at dinner parties because some of the other more conservative Romans are like, ew, I can't believe he was at the dinner party. But he was at the dinner party. So, you know, they're part of society. So there does seem to be room for people who don't fit into that norm to nonetheless participate. And there again, we maybe are getting into identity. Um, It seems like it's possible to believe that there were people who had that sort of self-identification. Then we have other stuff like, you know, women who are too actively sexual are bad. But but nonetheless, again, we have women who are quite openly so. Um, And not only just having sex, but like, being the active partner in sex, right? Being the one who initiates, who even to the point of using dildos and things like that, because that's a possible thing. We have a little tiny bit of evidence for female homosexuality, but only a little. I mean, we have the famous Sappho, but we have lots of evidence from her, some evidence from her of attraction to females, to women. We don't have evidence for sex, but we have a few little other pieces. There's a word called trebass, which means rubber which seems to be the term used for female, for what we would call lesbians. Uh, but it only turns up a couple times and quite late. Like, you know, it's just Roman and Greek men don't really seem to care what women do with one another. Essentially, you might even say that under a, a classical ancient definition of sex, women can't have sex with one another. There's no such thing as sex if it doesn't involve a penis. Under their definition. Under their yeah. definition. You know, like this is sort of in their conceptual mm-hmm. world. Again, this has been argued with, but there's a lot of ways of suggesting and supporting that idea. And that's why it's not That mentioned. it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's not yeah. mentioned because it doesn't matter. Cause, you know, basically two things. It can't produce children, so it's not a threat, right? Mm-hmm. This, women having sex with women doesn't affect your inheritance laws. It doesn't matter. And nobody's penetrating anybody else. And if your hierarchical structure is all about who penetrates whom, who's active, who's passive. I mean, if they use dildos, they are. And there's lots of evidence for dildos for the ancient world, by the way, <laughs> in art. Quite a lot of evidence. In art and in artifact, too? Um, I don't know how many artifacts we have. They would probably have been wooden things, so. Okay. But, um, but definitely in art. But it's also not clear whether they're being used on women or on men. Uh, but anyway, meaningfully, they're not really penetrating anybody else. If that's your hierarchy, they're outside. They're on the side of that hierarchy. Mm-hmm. So, yes, we just don't have... So it's a evidence. possible side group. We just don't. Yeah, and for all we know, it was common. Mm-hmm. Women were always having sex and with that's one why another, they never it. and nobody ever bothers <laughs> talking about it because yeah. it's just seen as like, well, like everybody eats too, but we don't, you know, everyone defecates, but we don't mention it in passing. Like, you know, yeah. you know, like everybody's rearing children, but it doesn't come up all the time. So it's it's harder to know. So you mentioned Sappho. What kind of evidence do we have? You've mentioned a little bit of the stuff we have, but... Yeah, so Sappho only survives in fragments, and we only have one complete poem. And who was she, really? So, we yeah, know? so she's, well... <laughs> no. Sort of. Um, she's a Greek lyric poet from uh, around the 6th century, from the island of Lesbos. So not in Athens. Not in Athens. In fact, most of the Greek lyric poetry is not it's outside of Athens. So we know that's firm. Like, we know she really existed. We know she wrote poetry. She is considered, her poetry was very celebrated at the time. 
and later, and into the Hellenistic period. She was called the Tenth Muse because the Nine Muses are the goddesses of poetry, and her poetry was so good she was the Tenth Muse. Mm -hmm. There was also people in the uh, Hellenistic period really liked making catalogs of like five best tragedians and the ten best, ec you know, like we think about our canon, like yeah. what is in the canon. A lot of that was created by those Hellenistic librarians, essentially. And she always made it in the nine lyric poets, the nine top lyric poets. And so she was very well known and everybody liked her. But unfortunately, we lost most of her poetry. So we don't have that much. So we're trying to reconstruct what it was. So but we have other of, people talking about her. We have other her. people talking okay. about her a lot. We have quotations from her. A lot of our fragments are just quoted in other people's work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like a word. Yeah. Oh, she's a grammarian. She used this word in a strange case. So they quote a word. And I'm like, okay, Sappho used this word once. <laughs> in a weird grammatical <laughs> yeah, sense. Exactly. Yeah. Or like a sentence here or a few mm -hmm. lines here. And we have a couple of works that we know are translations of her or loose adaptations of her. But we don't have that much, so we're trying to reconstruct what our poetry is like. What we do have from the fragments we have is a number of poems where the speaker is clearly female and the addressee is clearly female. You can tell that in Greek very easily through adjectives and stuff, so that's, mm -hmm. you know, uncontentious. That's definitely true. And where the language is like, I am, I'm dying with longing for you. I am full of passion for you. Um, I look on you and your beauty is amazing. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That better. That was not really very. No, poetic. that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you study literature. Yeah. You don't write. I don't it, write right? it. exactly. Yeah. There's a room for a critic. <laughs> um, but you know, so that kind of stuff, right? And the question then is like, what does that mean? There's lots of ways you can be passionate about somebody. Like, so that's what I mean. But there's nothing explicit. There's nothing like I want to touch your breasts or mm -hmm. something like that, where we'd be like, okay. But they didn't really talk sense. about that in other poems. Yeah. So that's well, where... they. I mean. That's not so much, but the, like other poems definitely are like, your ass is mine. <laughs> like, you know, okay. like some, uh, not, not necessarily one's equivalent in genre to her, but there are lots of lyric poems that are not, there's no doubting what they're it's talking about. It's not for about. children. Yeah, not for children. <laughs> not for, they're not, you know, you're not going to read these at your wedding. <laughs> these are not. But we've only got fragments. So the fact we don't have that doesn't prove there wasn't any. And anyway, the absence of that doesn't prove it's not erotic love. If we had found it and it was a man to a woman, we would have, like, scholars would have always called it romantic love or sexual love. That's what people would have said. No one would have questioned it. So the only reason they're questioning it is because it's a woman. So I think the default assumption should be that, yes, this is sexual love. But because of this fragmentary nature, what is the context? Under what circumstances does an upper-class Greek woman express this to another woman? And then there's a number of poems where she's sort of saying goodbye to a woman who's going and saying, like, it's time for you to go off and get married now, and I'm going to miss you so much. So what's yeah. this context? So one theory that people have put forward, and I've got to say I don't think this is the standard theory anymore, but it was for quite a long time. But there's a lot of debate about it was that she ran some kind of school for girls. She was sort of a schoolmistress. A mistress, yeah. And that there was an equivalent to that male pederastic relationship, mentor relationship, but with women. So you have older women and younger women, and as those younger women are at the school, they have a sexual relationship with the older woman, and then they go off to get married, uh, having been trained in sort of whatever they're being trained in. I don't know. Do you think of it as a ladies' finishing school? Do yeah. you think of it as, like, maybe they're being taught poetry? I, I mean, this is part of the problem with that idea is, well, what are they being taught? What's well, they the... wouldn't have become literate necessarily because most women didn't write. Well, yes, except Sappho is yeah. literate and is a poet, and... So it's not impossible that upper class women are being taught literacy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she does. And she clearly has like good grasp of Homer. We really don't know. We don't know enough about the society in Lesbos at that point. But we don't have outside of her poetry. We don't have any secure evidence for such a thing existing. Mm -hmm. You know, and remember, girls are mostly getting married at 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. Where is this falling? But then that's at Athens. Maybe at Lesbos in the 6th century, there is a culture. Think, Maybe this mm -hmm. is a religious, like a temple where there's a religious period of institution. Maybe. Like, those are all possibilities. Or she just has flings with girls and then they move on, you know, and that's also possible. So the thing is yeah. that the, the ancient sources themselves do not talk about her as homoerotic. Like, they talk about Sappho lots, but they produce this whole narrative where she falls in love with this man and tries to give him a feed of a love potion, and then she goes crazy, and he rejects her, and she kills herself by throwing herself off a cliff. And, like, it was this whole story. So that almost certainly isn't life. true. So we know almost nothing about her life. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, very little. Um, but the ancient world does not seem to treat her as being Different. what we would call a lesbian. We have a couple of references really, really, really late saying, oh, 
Some people say that she loved other women, but that's a shameful accusation. There's n- and they had access to all of her poetry, and yet they do not seem to be drawing that conclusion. So was it more of a norm? We don't know. Yeah, we're left with a bunch of questions. For obvious reasons, she has been held up as a you know, female homoerotic poetry, as an icon for the queer world. Like there's a lot, And I don't mean to undermine that. I don't in any way, I'm not trying to suggest it's not possible or even likely. I think it is likely that there's homoerotic elements. What isn't clear is how that fits into the larger culture and what it means in her life. We just have so little evidence for it. We don't even have like more than one complete poem. So it's not enough to. We just don't have enough. It's just enough to argue endlessly about and come up with great ideas, and not enough to securely prove any of them. So until we somehow archaeologically dig up something. Well, and more fragments from her do keep coming up because Mm -hmm. there are fragments of her poetry in those Egyptian papyrus dumps uh, where in Oxyrhynchus and other places. So it is not impossible we will find more of her poetry and that will help us. But given that the ancient world doesn't seem to have definitively had a view on it, I don't know, even if we get all of her poems. So we don't know how lyrical she was. No, and we don't know. how literate she was. Yeah, and we don't know how, you know, how much of her poetry is addressed to women. Like, on the flip side, we have lots of men who address most of their poems to women and some to boys. Did she address some of her poetry to girls and lots of it to men? And that's we why the ancient world it. thought she, you know, yeah. fell in love with this man. It's perfectly possible. We just don't know. She could have done. She both. could have done both. Mm-hmm. It seems to have been normal the other way. Why wouldn't it be normal? But I can't so say. Do we have any other examples either in Greek or in Roman, uh, the ancient world? Mm-hmm. Women writing. I mean, we have a, the only art, maybe one of the few Roman poets we have has a woman uh, writes love poetry to a man quite happily. Mm-hmm. It just gender flips the mm-hmm. um, standard poetry of the time. That's Sulpicia. Um, we don't really have artistic evidence of women together. We have a few where there's a dildo involved. Mm-hmm. Um, well, again, you but, said we don't know which we don't, way it goes. We don't, yeah. yeah, and we also don't know ones with several women. Like, think about lesbian porn now. Mm-hmm. Is it evident? Is, are those, I mean, there are actual lesbians, but is lesbian porn evidence for lesbians? Or is lesbian porn evidence for men liking to look at women having sex with one another? And when we look at vases where you've got two women, is that telling us that women had sex? Or is this telling us that like men liked having vases with women having sex on them, right? So yeah, yeah, as evidence for... The interpretations are too hard to... Yeah, yeah, it's very hard to know what they mean. So we we really don't have good solid evidence for Mm same-sex relations between women is the sort of conservative and safe answer. We cannot disprove it by any means but we can't solidly prove what its status was, mm-hmm. other than to say it doesn't seem to have been deeply disproved of because nobody bothers to forbid it. <laughs> we don't... Yeah, it's not... So that's so all we can really say. In the laws, as you've mentioned, yeah. so the women didn't get accused of... No, we have no evidence that it was ever like... Was it because uh, of the penetration issue? Again, yeah, where like did it, really the, where it didn't count as sex, <laughs> yeah. right? Like if it doesn't count as sex, then we also don't tend to see people caring that much about masturbation, for instance. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it comes up, and it's sort of a joke here and a joke mm-hmm. there and stuff, but, like, it's not a thing, people, it's not a shameful thing that people have to be, you know, stopped Worried from about. doing, yeah. like, unlike at some periods of time. So. Yeah, yeah. And so this ancient world was prior to Christianity. Yeah. So I'm guessing at Christianity, when that happened, things started shifting? It's a slow shift. There is definitely change, um, and... Still the patriarchy is... Oh, yeah, it's definitely yeah. patriarchal, and... Christianity changes the ancient world, but the ancient world changes Christianity too. Basically, the, over time, the Christian church becomes disapproving of homosexuality in any of its forms. But it's a slow process. By late antiquity, it's still not a big deal at all. It goes along with various other pagan practices that are slowly, you know, become less and less acceptable. Mm-hmm a much more solidification of what marriage is. I mean, in the same way that the Roman world, divorce is fine. There's no problem with divorce. Women and men both. In fact, in the Roman world, both men and women can initiate divorce very easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there's never a stigma. It depends why the divorce happens, and it can be a problem. But there's no sin to it. There's no idea of... It's no immorality to divorce. So when a woman or a man, doesn't matter who initiated, the woman always gets her dowry back. So when women get married... Greek and Roman. Greek and Roman. Um, except in very exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. But basically, usually the woman gets whatever property came with her to the marriage is returned. Uh, Again, she doesn't get custody of children. Mm -hmm. But there's no, like, contentious divorce cases in the sense of who gets what, because there's just a law. She gets her dowry back, but she doesn't get anything else. But just as a piece of evidence, you know, divorce, there's no immorality attached to divorce. Let's put it that way. By the 10th century, divorce is a sin. 
There's no concept of that in the Roman world. It, basically, mm-hmm. it's a legal matter. Uh, it's only when it becomes a sacrament. But that sort of, it takes a long time for the early Christian church to regularize this stuff, to sort of figure out what is and isn't a sacrament, what is and isn't correct, what so is and isn't allowed. And, and it, everybody has different ideas about it, right? And so eventually, sexuality becomes restricted to more what we, we know it as. But well, through the Middle Ages, there's also homosexual activity going on, yeah. and some of it quite openly. And, you know, mm-hmm. it really depends where you are in the Mediterranean or the European world and what's considered acceptable and not and how openly and all the rest of and it. And what type of religion you yeah, have. Yeah, what also. religion you have. And, mm-hmm. yeah, so, you know, activity, it's much more varied than people tend to think of it as being. The Roman patterns of behavior and Greek patterns of behavior do change, over time, as Christianity influences everything, but not drastically or immediately, and not um, it yeah. didn't just come like illegal now. Oh from no, this moment by on. any means, no, no. It I just mean. took time for generations it's I to guess. change. Yeah, to change what they considered appropriate and acceptable, and different places and different bishops and different popes, and you know, mm-hmm. all of this sort of happened. And that's not an area that I could like tell you yeah, about no, the details. That's okay, but that's yeah. sort of how it slowly changes. And for a long time, the ways that Romans had always done things was the way Romans still did them. Mm-hmm. Same with the Greek world. So in the Greek world and the Roman world, all the lawmakings and such, what type of actual physical implements do we have? Is it on a type of paper? Is it on the rocks? Like what evidence do we... Yeah. yeah. So Archaeologically, let's see. We say. have different things. We have some laws. The Athenians were very fond of inscribing laws on stone, which was a great habit in their case. So we don't have all of those by any means, and other Greek cities as well. But we have some evidence. So some laws are actually literally we have what they wrote Mm -hmm. at the time. Passed a law and they said what it was. But not a ton of that. The Romans, we don't really have that evidence from Rome of laws specifically, not very much of that kind. A little bit, but not much. Most of what we have is preserved in other forms. So from the Athenian world, a lot of what we have is law cases, which cite laws they were written on papyrus, papyrus. probably, um, wax tablets for goodness sake. They were rewritten, rewritten, And then, then they've been, yeah, we don't have those original. We might have some papyrus that survives in Egypt, but even it's going to be hundreds of years after a period we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So we have very little actual material from the time because papyrus does not survive. It rots. You know, anything organic will, will disappear over 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. When I keep mentioning Egypt, it's because if it was buried in the sand in Egypt, away from the river... It's so dry that nothing organic... There's no moisture. Yeah, nothing. And so, like, Mm -hmm. little... Very technical term. (laughs) Little weebly things don't grow and can't eat things. Mm -hmm. So we have organic material surviving in Egypt, but nowhere else. So the manuscripts we have of Greek material come from, you know, the 14th century or whatever and and are on parchment. Uh, And the same for the Roman period. Now, the Roman period, we know so much more about Roman law than we do about Greek law because later emperors, Justinian most famously, but also Theodosius... Um, compiled laws into a law code, like got a bunch of lawyers and said, mm-hmm. okay, write everything down, write down like, and then there was a, like a separate companion of discussion of the cases and where proud precedent worked and whatever. Those got written down at the time, presumably on papyrus, probably. Maybe parchment. Depends on the period. Theodosius might have been parchment. And then that gets recopied and recopied. We don't, again, we don't have the originals or anything. Somebody just went down and like, the law on this is this, and here's these laws, and these laws were acted, and, and da, 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 so that a lawyer could consult it. And it becomes the sort of regularization of law. But those, again, were copied a million times, well, uh, several hundred <laughs> times perhaps, uh, to when they get to the point where we still actually have the physical objects. We do not have the original by any stretch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. And... Interestingly enough, I know that some people who look at ancient history mm-hmm. have a hard time piecing together that Egypt, Greek, and Rome happened around the same time. It seems to be almost two different worlds yeah. to some people because you'll study, let's say, Egyptology yeah. and then the ancient world, and it mm-hmm. just seems to be two separate subjects. So some of these laws and some of these practices, were they common? I know it's not your expertise, no, but, but you there do was know a little bit. Yeah, so like Egypt... It sort of depends what period of time you're talking about with obviously, Egypt, because yeah. obviously Egypt, when you talk about studying Egypt, the history of Egypt in terms of what we have evidence for goes back way before yes, we any absolutely. time we have for Greek and Romans. Around the time, you know, Egypt continues on in its happy Egyptian ways, um, and then it's sort of conquered by the Phoenicians, actually, towards, in what we would consider around the archaic and classical Greek period is when it's um, part of the Phoenician Empire, if I'm getting that right, and the Persian Empire. Let's say Persian Empire, probably not Phoenician. Okay. Persian Empire. Um, Yeah, the Persian Empire in the sort of classical period of Greece, 
And then, of course, we have Alexander the Great, and he dies, and he conquers the Persian Empire, so he gets Egypt. And when he dies, he leaves his general Ptolemy, takes over Egypt. And so the Ptolemies, that's P.T. Ptolemy, um, are the line of pharaohs that starts with that general and ends with Cleopatra, the, Cleopatra the seventh, the mm-hmm. one we all know. <laughs> that we've all seen in yeah, movies that we've seen and in such. Yeah. And so that period of time is known as sort of Hellenistic Egypt. So that's the time when the ruling people are Greek-ish. And that period then is overlapping with the later, the post-classical Greek world. Mm-hmm. And then it ends in 30 BC. And 30, and why 30? That's very specific. It's because that's when Octavian or Augustus, uh, the first emperor, as he's about to become, of Rome, conquers Egypt. That's the Caesar. One of the Caesars. What, the not, the Julius Ce- no, yeah. not the Julius Caesar. No, not the Julius Caesar. The second one. Okay. Um, the Augustus Caesar. Yeah, I know. They're very confusing. Yes. And Augustus, I, keep, I say Octavian Augustus because they're the same person, but he changes his name. It's very confusing. <laughs> and he calls himself Julius Caesar because he's the adopted son of Julius oh Caesar. So, yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah. But, uh, but so from 30 BC on, we call it Roman Egypt because it becomes a province of Rome. Now, the Egyptians... Mm-hmm. what's changing is your ruling class. But mm-hmm. of course, your ruling class is the people who leave most of the evidence, so it does matter to us. And the laws of Egypt, the laws of Egypt go, sort of become this strange mesh of Egyptian law, Greek law, then later Roman Yeah, that law. was kind of the question. I and guess so that I, was going I don't for. really know much about the mm-hmm. pre-dynastic Egypt so yet. What I know yeah. of that comes from um, the podcast, The History of Egypt. So <laughs> go yeah. listen to go that. Go listen to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but from the, for the Greek and the Roman period, a lot of what I'm saying broadly applies. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, the laws will be similar. The practices will be similar. Now they will not. I don't think the you know the Athenian practice of pederasty with this sort of aristocratic. Mm-hmm. That really is quite Athenian. And there's some other cities that do similar and things. And the patriarchy? But, was it that? Oh, it's all patriarchal. Yeah, even in I Egypt. I mean, even in Egypt, I, there were... At that time. Women did seem to have more rights, and there were sort of more um, freedom or ability within marriage to control their own property and things like that. But I would very much hesitate to say it wasn't patriarchal. Mm-hmm. You know, women have more rights than none. It doesn't really get you out of patriarchy. <laughs> So, you know, ooh, they get to inherit their own wealth sometimes. Hooray. There was a different status of women under Egyptian law itself. It seems to have been somewhat different than sort of Greco-Roman views. And then you get this kind of weird merge. And it really depends. You might appeal to different laws, too. Like if you're Egyptian, you'll appeal to the Egyptian laws. If you're Greek, you'll appeal to the Greek laws. Mm -hmm. You might choose which one's going to be better to serve you. So depending on what court you go to. Yeah, and things like that. So, um, so when it came to sexuality, do we see a difference too? <laughs> I think it's hard to tell. I don't have the, the evidence I know of, and it is definitely not my specialty. The evidence I know of from like Greco-Roman Egypt is of fairly standard sort of husband, wife, family relationships, you know, like you would sort of expect. Mm-hmm. And I don't know much about beyond that. Like mm-hmm. the evidence I'm thinking of is documentary evidence about wills and, you know, law disputes with one another, inheritance. But there's not a lot of poetry being written by people actual Egyptians that is making it to our record in, in Greek and Latin. Mm-hmm. You know, there's poetry in Egyptian from before. Yes. And that's its own tradition. And I can't really speak to that. So I don't the think the laws were similar, it seems, when it yeah. started meshing all the kingdoms Well, and once you together. get into the Roman Empire, technically the Roman Empire's laws apply everywhere there's the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. But how that actually plays out on the ground is going to be different. And, you know, what I was talking about was Rome. And broadly speaking, the Roman Empire, but I should definitely add the caveat that that is going to be different Like, if you go to Britain, you know, the way people in Britain are actually acting is going to be different than it is at Rome. And what their expectations are are going to be different, and they're going to be affected by local customs and all those things. And a lot of that we just don't have evidence for at all. And they've all got different traditions, different sexualities, you know, that they're going to be expressing. Um, So really, I can only speak to sort of the hegemonic, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the ruling class and their ideals. As you've mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, Was there any fun fact you wanted to mention? (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, I'll tell you sort of two. Okay. Um, One is that I have, it's not exactly about me, but one of the things that I am still on the lookout for that is related to the topic of this podcast that I very much want to own at some point, a replica of a set of Roman wind chimes. I don't know if you've ever seen these. There's a number of different varieties, but they were found in Pompeii. There's a bunch of different examples of them. And they're wind chimes. They're sort of hung up, little bells on them often, presumably for good luck, because everything's for good luck in the ancient world. Mm-hmm. And they are the one in particular set that I really like is uh, an erect phallus with wings and little feet 
and a little phallus of his own. And then, like, bells hung off all of the bits, and that was a wind chime. That's quite the art piece. There are, as I say, several examples of this, and I have as an abiding, like, hope in my life is to someday <laughs> own. Nobody seems to make them. Like, I go to these museums with them, I'm like, go to their gift shops, I'm like, come on, people! I would have hundreds of these. I mean, okay. Okay, um, we're putting it out yeah, there that somebody, <laughs> an artist, has like to get on this. <laughs> because they were meant, um, the anorak phallus was a good luck symbol to ward off evil. Also, the Romans, like, and many cultures do, uh, thought of laughter as apotropaic, as, like, scaring away bad spirits. You'd mm-hmm. laugh, and they'd run away. And so they thought, you know, they, like us, seem mm-hmm. to have thought that penis with wings and his own penis was pretty funny. And so like the humor idea hasn't is, progressed yeah. that far since <laughs> it's the Basically Greeks. a dick joke, you yeah. know, to, to ward off evil. <laughs> and so they would hang these things up to, like, protect their home. But anyway, so there's there's that. The other sort of facts about myself that are not as, uh, you know, nothing compares really to penis wind chimes, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With wings. <laughs> well, one of them, which you'll know if, if anybody who listens to our podcast mm-hmm. will know, is one thing is that I'm a definite cocktail enthusiast and have a little bit of a weakness for gin. Mm. I currently have, I think, on our shelf at home... At last count, I think I had 18 different types of gin. Lots of different varieties. Gin has a very wide range of flavors and things. Um, and my husband and I like making fancy cocktails. So we like to have a cocktail that's a theme. I love that you had to do the little yeah. history bit. It's with, like connected yeah. in some way, either the name or something in it. The Tom yeah. Collins was one of my favorites, oh, I think. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> <Thank laughs> that podcast was yeah. fun. Yeah, no, anything about jokes. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's always fun. And, um, but also it's just something we enjoy doing as like a, an activity together. Mm -hmm. and um, so that's a fun fact that's a fun fact it is a fun fact yeah and uh, I'll just share one little bit of that when my older son was in daycare we picked him up one day and the daycare worker said oh um yes one of the things he did today was uh he made me a cocktail (laughs) she said he pretended to shake me I don't know whether it was a martini or something like I don't really do cocktails so I don't know what it was (laughs) and we said it was probably Manhattan (laughs) Because he'd been, like, he was four, four, I think, or maybe three and a half. And, you know, Daddy had been, like, they'd been having Father Daddy, like, just shaking the shaker, right? Like, it makes a lot of noise. You put ice in it, and it shakes. And he was like, you want to shake it for Daddy? Okay, shake it for Daddy. And, oh, dear. (laughs) I was like, someone coming to take our kid away. (laughs) Fortunately, the daycare worker just thought it was cute. I was like, good, good. I, think I swear he doesn't educators. drink anything. It's okay. <laughs> it's just that he's seen yeah. daddy making a cocktail. <laughs> I think most educators hear many, many different yeah. things. And <laughs> I'm they not get able used to, to take it. What, what, yeah. what it means. They don't take it so literal. <laughs> but yes, after that, I was like, okay, well, um, maybe, maybe we should tell should... them. Yeah. <laughs> this is the daddy and mommy drink. <laughs> yeah. You can have the lemonade with the ice cubes that you can share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's, that's a pretty fun fact. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll have given all the information for the yeah. your podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. in the intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if anybody uh, missed it, just rewind. It. I know there's no rewind, but whatever. Restart. <laughs> Go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Just listen to it all again. I'm sure it's worthwhile. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Actually, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. I know you are very busy with your own podcast, much less you know family and all the teaching you do and such. <laughs> That must take a lot of time, so I appreciate you taking time in your lovely office with all your really cool books, which I always love. So, Well, thank you very much for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. It's it's a fun topic that I enjoy talking about, and I'm always happy to make time to not mark things and talk about fun stuff. It always sounds like a good time. Yeah. So Although we didn't much. have cocktails, I apologize. Yeah. No, that's all right. Um, it's probably not appropriate for <laughs> three o'clock in the afternoon on campus. It's like seven o'clock somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> so thanks. Thank again. you very much. <laughs> Wasn't that great talking to Dr. McMaster? And again, if you're not already a fan, you need to listen to the Endless Knot podcast. Now it's time for some book recommendations. The book recommendation for fiction would of course be Circe, written C-I-R-C-E by Madeline Miller. And our nonfiction book is A Companion to Greek and Roman Sexualities by Thomas K. Hubbard. You can find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at History A. There's also some links in the show notes. And don't forget to check out the website. I try to add little tidbits that are not in the podcast. I'd like to thank my husband, Jamie, our brood of kids, our family, our friends. Without them, I definitely wouldn't be adventuring through history. Un grand merci.